Hello and welcome to this virtual insights lecture about solidarity and care at the Newcastle Western Food Bank. The COVID-19 crisis has drawn attention to the importance of a strong food supply chain, but many of the UK's poorer citizens were facing problems accessing adequate food and basic necessities well before the toilet rolls ran out. In fact, the current crisis shows the limitations of food banks. They may mitigate the worst effects of, impact of food poverty, but they can't address its causes. This lecture draws on oral history interviews conducted with clients, volunteers and supporters of the Newcastle West End Food Bank since 2018 that demonstrate the vital role played by the food bank beyond the provision of food. Food Bank Histories is a collaboration between the Newcastle Oral History Collection of Northern Cultural Projects and Newcastle West End Food Bank. The researchers involved in this project are myself, Sophie Fish, who is Director of Northern Cultural Projects, and Dr Jack, Jack Hepworth. Uh, and in normal circumstances, we try to present together. And what, so while that's not been possible today, I do want to emphasise that the findings I'm discussing here are a collaborative effort. The West End Food Bank is one of the busiest in the UK. It started in 2013 in the Church of the Venerable Bede and now operates at two further sites, the Lilia Centre in Benwell and Leamington Methodist Church, as well as providing food parcels. Until the lockdown, they were providing meals uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at the Lilia Centre. As the name suggests, it was set up to cater for the needs of people in its locality in this case, Newcastle's West End, an area on the north bank of the time without fixed boundaries, but largely synonymous with the historically poorer, deprived areas of the city's west. While the majority of food bank clients live here, people come from all over the city and beyond. Many of those we interviewed reflected on the current struggle in this locality, with a strong perception of the impact of decline amid deindustrialization and more recent austerity. The COVID-19 crisis has created what Newcastle West End Food Bank CEO John McCorrie has described as the perfect storm. More and more people are needing help as they face job loss and mandatory five-week wait to access universal credit. Meanwhile, the normal donation supply chain is no longer fit for purpose, meaning less food and less financial donations, such as the regular NUFC Bands Food Bank match day collection. Despite this, they're still providing food parcels to people who need them. Figures show a 25% increase in demand in recent weeks, and they've been doing about 100 home deliveries each week to clients who are self-isolating for underlying health issues. Our research and other research into UK food probably shows that there is a really high correlation between people who need food banks and people who experience underlying health issues. To give you some stats from before the current crisis, the top four reasons for referral to a food bank in the Trussell Trust Network between April and September 2019 were low income, benefit delays, benefit changes and debt. Those reasons have been reasonably consistent over a number of years now. Since early 2018, the Food Bank History team have conducted interviews with 41 food bank clients, volunteers and supporters. We've also spent many hours at the food bank, sometimes helping the volunteers with basic jobs like doing the dishes, more often sharing meals with clients and having informal conversations with volunteers while they take a break. I cannot say this clearly enough. People need food banks because their income, either from social security or work, is not enough to live on. Food poverty isn't a special form of poverty, but it is a lens through which to understand poverty. Food Bank Histories is part of a growing body of research into UK food poverty that demonstrates the inadequacy of the UK social security provision. How welfare reforms over the past decade have negatively impacted some of the most vulnerable in society, especially people with disabilities and single parent families, and how chronic poverty experienced by those on low incomes leaves people unable to cope with life shocks, either financial or personal. Benefit delays and sanctions are examples of income shocks and are the leading cause of food poverty. By conducting oral history interviews that explore past and present experiences of poverty, 
our research is building a longitudinal understanding of how people have experienced and responded to food poverty across multiple generations. Our interviews with food bank clients were all conducted at the Lilia Centre, which tends to be the place where long time clients attend. So the majority of our interviewees are people who have a long term connection to the food bank. Most of the clients we've met have led a precarious existence for most or all of their lives, but they would usually say that they have managed. Yet without a strong safety net, negative events such as a job loss or a health issue easily trigger a crisis and often a prolonged period of hardship. Health problems are often central to the loss of opportunity and of autonomy. Injuries and diagnosis that lead to the loss of earnings appear as threshold moments in people's life course. For example, Kay in her 20s began her testimony by explaining the turning point in her early working life. She said, I was working in a pub, a very busy pub in town, and then I obviously had an accident, so I wasn't able to go back. You're better off when you're working, and now my money is just less than half. So I'm living on next to now, really, and that's why I come here. Client and volunteer Jess recalled escalating health challenges, preventing her from working, compounded by changes to her benefits that ultimately saw her and her two children in hostel accommodation, in the hostel, she was unable to make use of her usual strategies to manage money, such as using a chest freezer to store food in bulk. And that made it impossible to weather the financial storm without access to the food bank. Moments of tragedy, acute loss and shock punctuated many food bank clients' testimony, especially men's. This is Lee. I met your girlfriend when I was 19. And she just died a couple of years ago. And this is how I'm in this predicament where I am at the swim bank. And I was with her for 20 years and I've got two children to her. I walked in and hold my hand in the hospital. She said, I love you, man. Mm. They put her in a coat, man, and she said, Come out. She said, Only just turned out. So it would just be for a meal or a bit. It breaks me flipping off. So this day, what a, it was a couple of years ago. Okay, I gotta get over it. So anyway, after that, I lost my job. Because I looked after the kids. Then all the benefits stopped. Whatever she was getting, because I didn't know what they were getting. And now they put me on this bloody universal credit, which is breaking me back. I still have to be paid. So I mean, uh, this is really hard. This. Um, I like it. But at least I get a hot view, you know what I mean? It's just a sad story and it's the truth, isn't it? Lee mentions he has a large family, but his family isn't able to help beyond emotional support. This is where the food bank steps in with more than just food. Although, as he says, the hot meal is important. Sometimes clients become volunteers. Emmanuel came to the UK from Eritrea as a refugee and needed help from the food bank when he first arrived in Newcastle. When we spoke to him, he said he volunteered to offer, um, he said that volunteering offered him a space for social interaction because he was working as a security guard and didn't get to speak to anyone all day. Through our initial interviews with clients, volunteers and supporters, we began to see there were significant commonalities in their experiences. Quite a few of the volunteers also experienced life shocks that led them to the food bank and talk about the emotional benefits they get from volunteering. Vicky's one of the younger volunteers. Her working background is in broadly in care and social support, but serious physical and mental health problems mean she's now unable to work. Food bank on the look north or somewhere I thought that sounds interesting. And um, I live in the West End anyway, so I knew exactly where the place was. Emailed, got, went up, had it around, and they just said, right, what do you think? Well, yeah, when do you want to stop? So when it was just based up at the Ven Beaver Church, I was there in the kitchen, just doing teas and coffees, because mm -hmm. I can't lift any heavy stuff. Because at that point, I didn't want to really kind of like talk to people. Yeah. Um, but what's brilliant, really brilliant about coming to the food bank is 
that actually makes you realise that actually sometimes my life isn't as bad as it could be. And I love the honesty with clients. Mm. But no, I do. I just I absolutely love it because it's really refreshing in comparison to the other, all the other stuff I've done. And things like if I haven't been here for a while, I go, oh, Vicky, I haven't seen you for ages. Are you all right? And oh, you didn't look very well last week. Are you all right? And it's just really nice because then it's like they're grateful for the help that they're being given and the fact that you, you know, you're, you're sitting and chatting to them. They don't always want to talk about the problem, mm. but just sitting and chatting to them. You know, sometimes they will tell you, I think it just depends, but honestly, it's been like a breath of fresh air. I absolutely love it. It's not hard to make historical comparisons between the punitive approach to welfare in the current model and the Victorian workhouse system. And food banks can sometimes seem like they're part of that. But at the Newcastle West End Food Bank, the localised sense of community solidarity that drives much of the volunteering mitigates against a top-down charity framework. Rules are interpreted in a way that makes sense of context. Kathy's one of the founding volunteers and her motivation to help comes from her own experiences of hardship. This is what she has to say. You know, to have sympathy for somebody means that I'm looking down on them somehow. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Whereas if I'm empathising with them, I'd say, well, I can understand your problem. It's not my problem, man. I'm not going to carry it. But I empathise for what you've got. What I'm going to try and do is help in this instance. But I don't promise you. Do you see what I'm saying? I can see the, oh, try this because this might work. Whether you treat that advice, it's your life, not mine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But you can't sympathise with people because you're looking down on them if you have sympathy. You empathise because you go, oh, my blood, that's not me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, but I'm going to try my best to get you into that situation. You have to empathise with people. You know what I mean? We have all these different things wrong with Every single person's got something wrong with them. Everybody. Some are lucky, some are not. You need to be able to see, I can help as far as I can go. But then it's up to you. Mm -hmm. That's empathy. Empathy seeing is, I'll take you so far by the hand, well, then it's up to you. What Cathy describes as empathy might also be called solidarity. Whatever word we use, it's an approach that involves walking alongside those people in our community who are experiencing hardship. It's about realising that they are us. Dean describes what this feels like for him when he walks in the door of the food bank. You come, you get your three days worth of food, but they always give you the extra. Wherever, if you go to the bead or you come to here, there's always that little bit extra that comes in and you're free to take enough what you need. And this stuff are amazing. They really are. They look after you if you've got any issues when you're feeling poorly. You just want to go and have a little chat to someone, shoulder to cry on, anything. The staff are there. There's just no, you don't have to make a meeting or anything like you do with the job centre if you want to speak to someone. There's always someone in the food bank that will sit with you and you can just literally offload as much as you like and the support's there. It's actually better at the food bank for the support than it is actually going to see the job centre because the job centre don't listen. Food bank staff do. They literally take everything because they see so many people over the week with the same issues. They support you far, far more. So that's why, unfortunately, I'm a regular now for about a year and a half, close to two years now for the food bank. And you never get questions, you never get told you've been coming here too long. You can come here as long as you like. And they will always welcome you. There's a cup of tea. Everything is just there. Recently, we've been exploring the idea of life shocks further in follow-up life story interviews with 10 volunteers and long-term clients. We asked them about times in the past when life was hard for them or their parents and grandparents. We wanted to know how people coped in the past and what's different now. We heard stories of neighbours rallying around, in particular when Shirley's mother had to go to hospital for an operation, but also in more everyday ways, passing down clothing or sharing food. 
A few people remembered neighbours providing ad hoc childcare when their mother had to work. And Janet could name a long list of aunties who lived in the same block of flats and helped her mum out when times were hard. Neighbourly support could also be directly financial. Kath recalls door-to-door -door collections for her neighbour's funeral costs to avoid the shame of a pauper's funeral. Shirley remembered that the co-op Divi was an important part of her mum's budgeting strategy and Keith talked about his mum and how she relied on tick from the local shop to get from one payday to the next. As we listened to these past stories interwoven with stories of now, we realised that food bank clients and volunteers alike are drawing on older traditions of solidarity and mutual support to respond to contemporary hardship. This is James making the connection between the past and the present. We father had a car. He got a car and of course he knew somebody across the road called George Beanbridge. So they used to mend the cars you could then, you could come in, you know, mend your own car, repair the bodywork and that sort of thing and inspect it. You know, you could then. Went there. And we used to go down the road and had to take people's gardens, the back gardens over for them, or clear them, you know. Just people down the road. But, um, so you did all that for free? Well, yeah. But I mean, it's just, you know, it's just what people did, now, you know, I just uh, don't want to go down and clear this garden. That's from this, this, so and so, you know, or uh, up the road. Mm. And that's all changed, isn't it? No, I don't think it has, to be honest. I, I really don't think it has. I think it's um, people still, I've, I've heard people here helping out each other in the, in the food bank, you know, doing three of us for each other. I, think it's, I don't think it's really changed, to be honest. In almost every interview, there are small mentions that substantiate James's view. Jim goes every week to do housework for his ex-partner who's disabled. Denise carries dog treats to help rough sleepers with pets. Keith is too old to take on heavy digging work at the food bank garden, but he shares his expertise with Laurie and the younger volunteers. And should he ever have lots of money, he says, I'd probably give it away to charity. Simple as that. You might not believe it, but that's what I'd do. During the current crisis, people from all walks of life have been drawing on traditions of mutual aid. In oral history interviews with food bank clients and volunteers, this history is abundant. We need to take the time to listen and learn from their experiences. More importantly, we need to learn how to care. Thank you.